And I'm your emergency speaker for today. They asked me to give this talk on Thursday, so I have not practiced nor timed this, but it does have a lot of animated jifes in it. <laughs> <laughs> so prepare yourself. Jifes is the, uh, the RC Cola of gift pronunciation. It angers everyone. <laughs> So yeah, a little bit about me. Um, I'm Galaxy k at pretty much all the things. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I recently graduated from UC Santa Cruz, so I'm now Dr. Galaxy Kate. <laughs> um, I'm probably best known for writing the language Tracery, which powers a site called Cheapbots Done Quick. So I'm the proud grandmother of 10,000 Twitter bots that we know of, <laughs> including Infinite Scream, the greatest ever Twitter bot. Um, so that's kind of part of my mission, uh, is to help people well, so my mission statement is um, I bring AI to people that AI doesn't deserve, because AI is a little bit of a trash fire. Um, and I don't want to just like bring poets to it so that they, can, they too can live in the trash fire, um, but to take the, the tools from AI and bring them out to other people. Um, and so I'm currently being generously funded by the Center for Research and Open Source Software, EC Santa Cruz, so I wanted to give them a shout out. Um, I also brought a bunch of swag, so I brought those zines that are out there as part of my mission to bring cool tools to poets. Um, I also have, if anybody has made bots, however you define bots, um, I have merit badges, if you think you have earned a, a bot merit badge. Um, and yeah, I have lots of zines. Um, I also make just an absolute ton of weird prototypes. Um, I almost never finish anything, just because there's always new shiny stuff to be made. Um, yeah, just lots and lots of prototypes. Um, but my research over the last eight years, so I, I wrote this dissertation on something called casual creators, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment. But these are um, software that is for creativity, but not in the way that like Photoshop or GarageBand is about creativity or for creativity. Um, those are things that are for getting you to a product. Your boss says they want this thing. Your brain says it wants this virtuosic opera. They're all about the product. Um, it turns out there's, a, there's this other weird class of software um, and I played a lot of kid picks back in the day. And the guy who made kid picks wrote this really lovely essay about what it means for him to have built kid picks and why he built it the way he did. And he talks about how the process of making a picture should be as important as the picture produced. If you're working for Pixar, this is not a thing to tell your boss. <laughs> um, <laughs> they don't care about your process or how you feel when you're making it. They care about the product. Um, but there's this whole class of software that I think is really interesting because it uh, is about uh, the process. Um, so I, did, like, I needed a term for this, so I called them casual creators. Um, these are everything from like Burger King, Simpsonify yourself, uh, Simpsonizer, um, like weird doodly, like make a cake pop apps, of course, kid pics, um, any of the things where you doodle on your phone and it like kind of multiplies out your effort in interesting ways, things where you can doodle music, you can doodle sound, um, even things like connects where you're like not so much about making the thing, you're about like the physical pleasure of snapping things together. Uh, Rainbow Loom, if anybody's of the Rainbow Loom generation. Um, but when I was writing this dissertation, and it took me forever, um, I had to go through a lot of like process of like, what is creativity? Um, and we often say that people are creative. So like Mozart is creative and Steve Jobs is creative. Um, and in my research, this seems to not be true. There are not, there's not a class of creative and uncreative people. Um, as far as we can tell, everyone is creative. Um, however, has everyone seen the movie Inside Out, like the, the Pixar movie? And like at one point, she develops this new superpower of disgust. Um, there is, in fact, a moment in your childhood from about the age of six to about the age of 12 where you discover disgust. And it goes from physical disgust of I don't like broccoli to social disgust of I don't like this person or this activity. And then you see like other people being disgusted by you. And so if you ask a group of, so if you ask a group of six-year-olds, can you paint, can you draw, can you dance, they will all say yes, because at that moment they know can as the physical act. I can move my body, I can hold a pencil, I can make my mouth tell a story. If you ask 12-year-olds, or heaven for fan, 35-year-olds this, they will all sit on their hands, because they know that can you means can you do so without being disgusting to yourself in the world. <laughs> um, and this is actually an issue, like when you read about creativity, 
uh, and you're not Steve Jobs, you read about people's fear of creativity. And so it's not so much about are you creative, but like what is currently keeping you from being creative? What is like your fear of creativity? Um, I love this. Can I draw? How to tell if you're good enough? Like not even just good at drawing enough. Are you good enough? Do you have the moral <laughs> fabric to draw? This is Calvinist art education. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a little bit about problems and creativity. These are just a couple of the problems that have been discovered. You can read any of the, the previous books on the previous slide or just anything on Pinterest to say, like, what are the issues with creativity? Um, there are things like being undirected, like freezing up, uh, being trained to come up with the right answer. Um, you know, are you, are you good enough for this crowd? Like, is, is this the right answer? Is this what you wanted? Um, being afraid of negative judgments, running out of ideas. Um, there's a uh, Winston Churchill after like um, World War II and being probably like one of the most powerful men to ever live on this earth, um, retired and started watercolor painting and was very bad about it. And he wrote a book about being bad at watercolor painting. And it, he has this anecdote in it where he is staring like in terror at a blank page. And one of his lady friends comes up in a car and like throws paint on it. It's like, now you can start. And Miracle of Miracles, it turns out he could. So this is not something that affects like you know, people who are not good enough or creative enough or powerful or enough. Everybody has this aspect in their life. Winston Churchill being a very complicated example. Um, <laughs> but no matter what you can say about Winston Churchill, he was bad at watercolor painting. <laughs> um, so I worked on a game called Spore way back in the day in 2007. Um, and Spore had this real gem of something called the Creature Creator, where you could like draw, like sculpt out a little creature and it would come to life under your hands. Um, and we got really wonderful letters, like handwritten letters from people saying, like, this game made me feel creative again, um, which was kind of in, like awesome. Like, we we're getting a lot of hate on the internet, but we would also like get <laughs> handwritten letters from people who said, like, I thought I wasn't creative anymore, and now I know I was wrong. Um, and this was designed with improv uh, kind of knowledge, because Heim Gingold, the guy who designed this, was taking like improv, like high level improv classes at Berkeley while he was designing this. So this is just like jammed full of every improv principle he could think of. Um, think, and there's like books like Impro, which kind of laid out what improv would later be. Um, but these are kind of like things like, you give people prompts, you give people acknowledgement when they do something. Whatever arm or stupid accessory you put on your creature, it will look at it and nine times out of 10, it'll go like, yeah, that was really good. <laughs> And you know, sometimes they'll be like, no, that was terrible. Just to give you a little bit of feedback of like, it acknowledged you, it saw you. Um, yes and, this is the idea, like this is the most like caricatured bit of improv, this yes and is like, it sees what you did, it internalizes and then it like adds something new. So now you have something to bounce off to. Um, so the questions of, so I'm not gonna go a lot into casual creators in today's talk, although I'd encourage you to read my zine about it, which is outside. Um, or just ask me about it on Twitter. Uh, so the question is, how do we get people to be creative? Uh, how do we get people to move? And how do we get people to move creatively? So this one is just going to, this talk is just going to be about like casual creators for dance or like um, ways to help people move creatively. And then how do we do all this with a computer? So let's do some improv. Uh, raise your hand if you felt a sick feeling in your stomach when I said let's do some improv. <laughs> all right. Uh, so first off, do something. Woo! All right, very good. Say something. Hi. Your hand is a puppet. Say hello to your neighbor. <laughs> Name a Pokemon. <laughs> oh, the year was 1778. <laughs> yep. So what did this teach us? Uh, aside from the fact that we now know who the Canadians are. <laughs> so we like to be right when we're answering. Um, if there's not a right answer, we'll often freeze up. Like, did it, like, reflect on when I said do something and you thought, like, is this thing that I'm about to do too big? Is it too small? Am I doing the right thing? What's my neighbor doing? Um, is my neighbor looking at me? Oh, gosh. Um, prompts are really great for this because they give us a few possible right answers. Um, or you know, they'll give us a prompt. So like, if I say your hand is a puppet, there are lots of ways your hands could be a puppet, but probably the right one is to do this. And then I've given you a prompt, say something to your neighbor or say hi to your neighbor, then it makes it kind of easy to like say hello. Um, there are lots of things that you could have done with that prompt, but there was kind of an easy right answer. And so that gives people 
just really two choices of like go with the easy route or try to like add on to the easy route. Uh, and limiting people to two choices seems like a really strong like a really strong pattern in this sort of thing. So lessons. Um, <laughs> prompts can be verbal. Um, like I just gave you verbal prompts. They can also be props. I can hand you a shovel on an improv stage and say do something and that shovel will tell you what it was that the right answer is and kind of what your options are for creative writer answers. Um, they, can be, they can be music, so things like um, clapping uh, or just like dancing to whatever beat is like, you know, many of, many of us have personal dancing styles and a lot of those are just like uh, event reaction uh, to, to beats. Um, they can be clothing. So this is um, uh, things that you should not do to your cat, but this is uh, apparently this was used in uh, uh, How to Train Your Dragon. They put a bit of tape on the back of a cat and use that as art reference. Um, so when you add things to your body, it makes you move differently. And we'll talk a lot about that later. They can also be cultural expectations. So like the 1778 one is a very like, people have cultural expectations of what you say after that. Um, you know, YMCA is something that like, once you're trained into it, you can always dance that dance at every wedding you go to in the future. And like different subcultures will have, you know, this is the dance that everybody can do because this is the dance that everybody knows how to do. Um, and so it makes people who would otherwise feel terrified of dancing know that like, yes, I can do the Hora, yes, I can do the YMCA, yes, I can do the electric slide. Um, and you will do it well enough to not be disgusting to those around you. And again, this is like, everyone can dance we're letting them know that they're allowed to dance. Um, so one thing that I like to say here is clothing is an improv partner. This is one of the biggest things that I found. Um, everybody knows if you wear a cape that there are a certain number of cape moves that you can do. <laughs> um, if you ever need to like do motion capture and somebody is like not moving enough, give them a cape and suddenly they'll move a lot. Um, <laughs> these are, there's a, a, a board called the um, greatest movie capes and there's like 60 different capes in movies that are great. Um, so a cape is a yes and, like I move, and the cape moves more in an ex unexpected way. Um, it's a prompt, like I know that there are things that I can do with this cape. Um, it's a prop, like maybe it makes me feel like I'm a superhero. Uh, it's a partner, it's reacting to my motion, it's making motion that I can then react to. Um, and in animation, this is called secondary motion. This idea that like when you move, something else moves with you. Um, and so like Bugs Bunny's pigtails, Ariel's um, tail, uh, Bugs Bunny's ears, these are all like secondary motion. On Spore, we had a ton of secondary motion. We in fact had a whole secondary motion system called Wiggles and Jiggles. It had like a full-time animator figuring out like when you move, should your antlers move? Should your legs move? Um, when you run, should like your knees move more or should they be like kind of fixed? Um, and so yeah, like we got a lot of interesting stuff out of this because the animators could make one animation, so this is their like internal animation tool. Um, they could say like, okay, do the jump animation and then say with any possible weird body morphology, how should that, like what should happen then? Um, so they could tune this very, like, uh, very carefully so that stuff could move in a way that they thought was about right. Um, so yeah, that's how humans do it. Um, let's figure out how computers do it. I had to have one awful AI slide. Um, <laughs> so now let's talk about dancing with the computer. Um, this is not specifically what I mean, um, although this is something that came out, gosh, uh, probably in the early 2000s of a ballroom dance partner um, out of Japan. Um, but we can talk about types of human computer dance interaction. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wrote a paper, like a, sh a very short paper, trying to at least tease these out. And as far as I could tell, there are like kind of three different ways that you can respond to somebody's body mo movements. There's costumes and wearables, which is like attached physically to your body, which are like immediate body centric motions. Um, there's fields where you're like disru disrupting a field of something. So like I'm walking through grass and the grass like parts and waves as I move through it, or I like you know, you're in one of those like lagoons with the bioluminescent bacteria as you move, like little sparkle flows flow out around you. Um, and you can make that digitally. Um, and then there's agents where something is capable of acting on its own. Um, and the questions here are, how does the computer listen? Like, what is it listening to? Is it listening to your body movement, your heart rate? How does it know your body movement? Is it just like looking for like, you know, maybe there's a security camera and it's just looking for pixel differences or is it actually trying to like figure out where your skeleton is? Um, is it listening to your voice, trying to match your pitch, things like that? Um, how does it speak? Is it, you know, making uh, visuals around you? Is it making the, the, the audio change? Um, is it physically pressing against you? 
And then the last one is kind of interesting because this is a, a lever that you can kind of tune. Is it a mirror or an agent or something in between? So here's a cape, our good old friend, the improv cape. Um, but this is in Doctor Strange, and his cape is actually like a sentient being that fights him sometimes. And it'll change throughout the scene and throughout the choreography of like, it's just a cape, I can do things with it, to like, this, is th this object is physically fighting and is a, like a fight partner with me. Um, so it's really interesting to watch that choreography. Um, the one at the bottom is the Marx Brothers, where uh, it's a classic comedy scene where somebody is pre like trying to hide from another person by pretending he's in the mirror. Um, but imperfectly matching his movements. So you can have something where like, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the computer and the computer is responding to me directly, 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 and then it says stop, like I'm gonna do some improv here. So you can tune this back and forth. Um, oh yeah, so, okay, so let's talk a little bit about costumes. Um, I do a little bit of dance, like I'm really bad at dance. I am, I am just a casual creator at dance. I am just like dancing well enough to be not horrifying to myself and others. Um, or at least I have convinced myself that. Um, but dance has this wonderful tradition of adding a lot of secondary motion. Because as anyone in ballroom dance knows, you have you, your partner, and then you have all the flu like flowing dresses around you that augment and basically yes and your motion. So you do a twirl and the dress says, wow, what a twirl. Uh, or you jump and you're like, your fringe says, wow, what a jump. Um, so like your outfit is your hype man. Um, and like anybody who goes to raves knows that this is true. You have these flow toys. Like if you just saw somebody standing there dancing, doing this, you'd be like, wow, that person is not good at dance. But suddenly if there's <laughs> fire involved, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, this is like yes and for physical gestures. Uh, some important things about like costumes, it's locationally, directionally, and temporally linked to the movement. So I do this and my sleeve should do that immediately. I shouldn't do this, and then the computer chugs for a while, and like 15 minutes later, it's like, I figured out what to do. Um, it should cause a very direct causal link. And the nice thing is you get kind of emergence when you move, and these things persist over time. So like that cool like shoe, uh, glowing shoe, like time lapse thing going on down there. Um, I went to a taiko drumming thing recently, and I thought that that was really fascinating because um, this is also, it's a dance form where you're hitting drums. Um, and so they're like, they'll do this, but as the accent to that, the drum is almost like a wearable or a dance toy, where as you do this, then you get a big boom at the end. Um, the one at the top is Fred Astaire doing um, a famous dance where he's throwing down those little like um, poppers um, and then tap dancing on top of them. So as his feet hit the ground, there's a snap of his shoe hitting the ground and then usually there's a little explosion. So it's like taking the normal tap accessory of hitting your shoe against the ground to create rhythm, and like doing even more so. And now you also get like smoke plumes. Um, I promised y'all more Muppets. So we're just gonna keep doing Muppets here. I hope everyone's okay with that. Um, Muppets are really great because, uh, uh, so a lot of this talk was inspired by a visit I did to the Atlanta Center for Puppetry Arts, which everyone should go to, and they had the Henson wing was open. And you could see all the Henson Muppets. And for the first time, I wasn't just looking through like a VHS tape, I was looking at the actual Muppet itself. And almost none of them are bear Muppets. They're never like bear felt. Um, there are very few that are. Most of them all have stuff on them. They all have these dance accessories on them. Uh, and these dance accessories are props that tell you how to move this Muppet. Like imagine you had Janice over there on your hand and you were like, you know, somebody called in sick at the Jim Henson lab and said, you're a visitor, come here and you play Janice for the day. And immediately you put her on your hand and you start doing this. Because her hair says do that. Like if you wear, um, I forget what that guy's name is, but you start doing this because his hair really wants to do that. Uh, these are like hand capes. They tell your hands what to do. Um, and this is great because you can make people play with puppets very easily. And then you can also um, kind of have really new experiences. So there's uh, an artist, Nick Cave, not that Nick Cave, who makes these things called sound suits that are really incredible. And then like um, other people are doing digital animations on top of bodies to kind of have these like surreal secondary animation just all over the body. Cats does not do this. There is no body movement in cat, like there's, <laughs> why? <laughs> and just like one whole scene, like one whole slide of animal because animal is the best. Um, but look at all the different things that his hair is doing. So like, especially in this one where it's like movement, 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 and then still, um, like as he's like coming to this revelation. Um, and so like his, his hair and how it moves and when it's still and when it's moving, it's part of his character. Um, Muppets have almost no facial animation. Many of them don't have eyes. 
count how many Muppets you think have eyes and then look, and it's almost none of them. <laughs> the Swedish chef has almost nothing on his face. He's like a nose with eyebrows. Um, and yet you would swear up and down you've seen, that you've, swe you've seen the Swedish chef blink. Um, and again, it's all this secondary animation. Um, so yeah, I, I actually got to play a little bit with this um, in a project that I did for Google Creative Labs. Um, they had something that was kind of like the Kinect, but for um, a regular webcam, so it would be able to detect your body pose. Um, the tech never ended up working out, and this didn't actually end up shipping, although sh I'll show you something else they made with that tech. But this was me trying to like interpret Nick Cave sound suits and Muppets into a digital costume that people could wear. Because the idea would be, would, they wanted something so that people could download an app, walk in front of their webcam, and then do something. And we know from before how bad do something is. Uh, and so I wanted to give them a, cop, uh, um, a costume so they walk in front of the camera and suddenly you have very long arms. And imagine how you would move if you had very long arms. Maybe very long arms and a giant mohawk. Like you would move in different ways. And there's also a whole bunch of like mask theory stuff that you can go into of like when you look at yourself and you're not yourself, you suddenly have wild freedom. Um, it, you know, as exposited by The Mask, 1995, Jim Carrey. Um, <laughs> it's nonfiction, people. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's like another way to get people uh, over their fear of creativity, is to make them look at themselves as not themselves. And so yeah, I had like a little virtual body, and this is just controlled with Perlin noise, because uh, the, the body detection stuff wasn't really working at that point. Uh, and actually, at that point, it was so secret, I didn't have access to the pipeline of body data, so I just faked my own. Um, and then you just remap that in weird ways with like different curves. Um, and you can kind of accent the curves in different ways. Um, and then I ended up with just, yeah, all these like weird body costumes that like follow your limbs in different ways. So one of these days, I'll ship this um, when, the, when the technology like becomes more available. Um, but yeah, the most important thing in this sort of uh, project is immediacy. Um, and the second most important is connection, like knowing that you have influenced the world, but that's often driven by immediacy. Um, I did a lot of research on like various academic projects um, for like, there's a lot of generative dance out there, especially in the uh, com computational creativity community. Um, I don't think they're getting it right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of projects that are getting it more right, and so I wanted to show you a couple of those. This is Lumen AI, which is like a huge multi-person project out of Georgia Tech, um, and there's like a dome, and you're in there with a VR, like, or with a like virtual uh, shadow that's like dancing. Um, one of the issues, though, is that it's what they chose to do was not immediate. They decided to go very agent-based, where this thing is autonomous. So you dance for a while, and then you pause, and then it'll dance like you, except that you're not sure if it's improv or if the connect stopped working, or um, if it's just like doing really creative improv. Um, so this has one of the, the issues that like, if you as the designer cannot tell whether or not the connect is plugged in, um, anybody who's been in this space, like making a real creative thing that like deals with some like input, and you're like, wow, it's doing it really well, it's doing it really well, oh, the socket wasn't plugged in. <laughs> um, yeah, you can, you can easily lie to yourself that like more improv is happening and not just like noise. Uh, this is another project from Google that, you, that did end up using that TensorFlow stuff. Um, you can see kind of how janky it, like, it's following the body. Uh, so what they did was re they very cleverly didn't do a continuous thing, although it feels almost continuous. It's just searching the Google library for the, the pose that like, close, like, most closely fits your thing. Um, so it's like disconnected and kind of jank, but that's actually what it's like. That's very cleverly papering over an issue with the software. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll just go through this real quick. Oculus First Steps does some really great stuff improv with a robot, and then you get to hold hands with the robot, which is the only time I've gotten to hold hands with anything in VR, and it's amazing. And this is their demo thing that they get you right out of. It's awful. Um, so the question is really, what is dance about? Um, and there's a whole thing about like dance notation, and you have to notate what your dance is about, whether that's arm positions or physical positions or like where you are in relationship to your partner, which is that like ornate scrolly thing. Um, and there's a whole book on dance notation that is fascinating to a computer scientist. Um, but I do, ballroom, like, I do ballroom dance and swing, and so I think of them as like forces. Um, the one on the bottom is somebody at Google did this, and they were assigned to do this, and they hadn't um, swung, da swung danced um, before. <laughs> um, and so I was like, oh, here, let's swing dance. Like, see how it's all about like, your forces. You're pulling back and forth. And so they ended up capturing that really nicely, so I felt helpful. Um, so I do a lot of stuff with particles. 
Um, these are all just like different particle experiments. And like, um, I do a lot of stuff with hand tracking. So if you ever do hand tracking, make yourself a set of like infinite virtual hands that just do this. And that way you don't have to like switch between, um, between that all the time. So I have a lot of like virtual hands that just like oscillate forever. Um, and then just like particles that respond to those hands in some way. Uh, they're either following them or just kind of like attracted to them or uh, generated from them. And so I'd had this game that I had made a while back called Falling For You uh, that's dead from bit rot. Um, but you had little particle people falling, falling through space and falling in love and making like long polyamorous families, um, <laughs> which is accidental because people have two hands, so obviously. Um, and that was just like springs and particles. There's no like actual body animation in here. It's just like springs and particles and forces between them. Inverse kinematics is something that happens to bad people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, so I was, yeah, I was like, okay, well, I can make a body out of that, and if I've got springs and particles, then I can add dance tribbles. And a dance tribble in this project, and I know I'm kind of out of time, so I'll like, rush through the last of this, but I want to get into dance tribbles, because um, I don't want to just say that and leave. Um, so imagine that you have something on your hand. It's a dance tribble. It's a little sentient being, and it likes bass beats. And whenever it hears a bass beat, it'll pull up your hand. And then you have another one, and every time it hears a bass, like a treble beat, it'll do something else. And so now you have like, a rudimentary way to define force-based choreography. Um, and so I, I started like making a generator for this. Um, I had like AI or like um, genetic algorithm based bodies so you could like evolve little different like dance morphologies. Um, I had a dance descriptor so I got to put that in an actual like jazz hands in an actual academic paper. <laughs> um, and then let's see if so yeah, and then this is like applying dance tribbles to arbitrary meshes. And you can see that they're like mostly working out here. I'll let this go for like one and a half songs. Come on, switch. Yeah. So anyway, you can see that like you can get kind of like different stuff going on. And so if I added that to that, I got something that in fact did not work at all. Um, <laughs> I will revisit this someday. Um, so yeah, like we have more import devices than ever. Um, we have like Kinex and PoseNet and Leap Motion. Um, Oculus controls can now like listen to your bare hands, so you can do like fancy hand tracking. And so far, all that anybody is using them for is a button. Like do this to press a button. Do that to press a button. Do this to press a button. Um, they're not like responding continuously. So. My, uh, my question here, and this is just like a bunch of random stuff that I've made um, to respond to like hand tracking things. Um, how would you make, uh, like, so what is the future? Um, I tried to search for VR puppets, um, and there's like that one up there, and then it's mostly scary puppets that follow you in the dark. No one is, <laughs> no one is actually having you be the puppets. It's dreadful. Um, and the one in the middle is the Waldo system, which was like basically you do this with your hand, and this is how the Muppets um, did a lot of their like long distance Muppetry. Uh, but we're not like, we haven't like revisited that like 1980s technology, but now like with good hand tracking. So yeah, any questions? Um, this is my talk, uh, meet me outside. Uh, we can talk more about Muppets or I can teach you how to polka. Um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, Max who's in here somewhere and I are doing a workshop in uh, casual creators uh, at ICCC in Portugal this year if anybody has academic papers to send to us, but yeah. That was my talk. Yeah.